Hey everyone, this is Nick, and since I just turned 35, it's only fitting that this is the 35th Linux and open source news video this year. Except, no it isn't, but I just thought it would be nice for my birthday. Anyway, this time we have System76 unveiling more details about their new cosmic desktop environment. We have Apple siding with the Chinese government against protesters by limiting certain features there, and we have a big security and privacy issues with some smart cameras. And we also have Mozilla trying to build their own metaverse. Ooh, disgusting. Like this segue to today's sponsor. Wait, no, that doesn't work. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is the only solution I use to run my own Nextcloud server and my only Office server as well. It's a super easy solution to deploy basically anything you want in one click. They have a huge marketplace of applications you can host, from Nextcloud, WordPress, Drupal, GitLab or Grafana, to gaming servers for Minecraft, Arc, CSGO, Rust, Valheim and more. They take care of all the configuration for you. All you have to do is click the thing you want to deploy, fill in a few details and your server is up and running. And once everything is live, it's still super easy to manage your servers, to upgrade or downgrade them, add some storage, back them up, and get help if you're stuck. I've been using Linode for years now, and I can only recommend them. If you want to give them a shot, click the link in the description below, and you'll get $100 of free credit to get started. System76 unveiled a lot more details about their future cosmic desktop environment, set to replace GNOME in Pop! OS. They've done a lot of work on a compositor, which provides support for HDR, high DPI, and fractional scaling. They're also working on Cosmic Text, which is a text rendering engine to improve how fonts look on Cosmic applications. And they also worked on LibCosmic, which is their equivalent to LibAdvita. It's a library that contains all the widgets applications can use, like buttons, checkboxes, menus, or pop-ups. It uses the Iced toolkit, and it will be used to convert existing GTK4 applications from Pop! OS to Cosmic applications that are able to make use of the new compositor. The launcher, the app library, and the new workspace list will all be created using that toolkit as well. And they also said that they were working on a new panel or dock that lets third-party applets integrate with it, like system statistics, media players, or even running a game like Doom. On top of that, they shared screenshots of various settings, like the workspaces and their associated gestures, which look comprehensive, or from a navigation sidebar, which seems adaptive and responds to various window sizes. They also contributed directly to Iced to improve the toolkit. Apart from some screenshots, there's not much to look at, but it's still interesting to see that they're working on various features that are really often overlooked by Linux desktops, like HDR or fractional scaling. There's no planned release date yet, not even for an alpha, and we will also have to wait and see how these new Cosmic applications will be able to integrate with non-Cosmic applications. Apple has decidedly sided with the Chinese government in the recent wave of protests that challenged the Communist Party. Protesters used AirDrop in its most open setting to let anyone exchange messages and literature linked to the protests to bypass the Chinese government surveillance of all messaging applications available there and to protect their identity and privacy. Now, Apple decided in early November to release a China-only update that stopped that feature for working for anything more than 10 minutes before having to be re-enabled manually. They didn't mention that change in the update notes, only citing bug fixes and security updates, which is pretty shady of them. Apple apparently plans to make that update global next year, but that's not how they usually proceed, as they generally release updates worldwide for every device. This move is definitely in bad faith and concerning, but it's only the newest one in the long list of concessions Apple made to China, like removing a privacy protection feature from Safari or removing several VPNs from its App Store in China. It looks like doing business in China is more important to Apple than privacy and human rights, two things that they regularly tout as some of their core values which is a sobering reminder that companies are never your friend. They're in here to make money. 
If you own a so-called smart camera from the Eufy brand, it's time to disconnect it and dispose of it. The company prided itself on protecting user privacy by storing videos and data locally only. But this seems to have all been completely untrue, as some cameras are uploading photos, facial recognition imagery, and private data to the company's cloud servers without the consent of their users. This data is uploaded without encryption and stored with a username and identifiable information, even though this data had been deleted from the Eufy app. To make matters worse, the videos from the cameras can be streamed via a web browser or VLC without any authentication needed, which means anyone could basically look at what your camera is seeing inside your house if they can guess or brute force the right URL. The encryption applied to videos is also terrible, using a super simple AES-128 key that can be cracked relatively easily. Yuffi allegedly already patched some of the issues and explained that by default, no photos are taken or uploaded, but that changing some settings in the app, like receiving notifications, make that happen. It always seemed pretty obvious to me that putting a camera connected to the internet inside of your house was a terrible idea. If you don't control the servers or the data, don't put it in your home. If you thought Facebook or Meta was the only company to invest in the metaverse, think again. Looks like Mozilla also wants to be a part of that weird trip as they bought Active Replica, a startup based in Canada, developing a web-based metaverse. Mozilla bought it to support their own work on Hubs, which is an open source service of VR chat rooms, with stuff like virtual events, more interaction inside of Hubs, a better onboarding experience, or personalized subscription tiers. Mozilla's Hubs is already following web standards, supports most headsets like the Rift or the Vive, and is open to users who don't have VR hardware, being usable on desktops, laptops, or smartphones. They already had a $20 per month subscription for it, and with the addition of Active Replica, they plan to add a free version in the future, plus kits to create custom spaces and avatars, and also add more pricing tiers. And okay, the metaverse is just a dumb idea. It's a less convenient and less comfortable way of doing stuff that we can already do much better and much faster. But if it's going to happen despite our will and our best judgment, I'd rather it be an open metaverse, controlled by open standards, than Facebook's vision of it. Now let's take a look at what's new in GNOME. There's a new app called Boatswain that lets you control Elgato's stream decks. It's now part of GNOME Circle and it lets you set custom icons for actions, organize these actions in pages and profiles, control a music player, play sounds, or control OBS Studio. Money, the personal finance manager, has been revamped quite a lot, with a new way of organizing groups and transactions. There's a new transfer money action that lets you transfer money from one account file to another. You can filter transactions by type, group, or date, and a bunch of issues were also fixed. It looks like a pretty nice app to keep track of your spending, honestly. Loop, the new image viewer, now has support for zooming and scrolling in images with touchpad and touchscreen gestures. And Gradients, the Advaita theme manager, got a lot of fixes to ensure that your GNOME desktop looks its best. I must say I'm really interested in money. No, that doesn't sound right. I'm really interested in the money application. It looks like quite a cool app to keep track of your budget and spending, which I definitely need to do more of. As per KDE, they've been working on accessing iOS devices easily in Dolphin. They've worked on a KIO module, which is their system to handle file management, and it will show any iPhone you plug into your computer in the Disk and Devices applet and in the Dolphin sidebar. It will let you browse the file system and documents shared by various applications, which is pretty cool. On top of that, they overhauled the Dragon Player UI with a hamburger menu and a welcome screen, and also less glitches on Wayland. They added a sidebar to FileLite, the Disk Usage Viewer app, they simplified how to add or change a weather location, and rolling fingerprints to unlock your desktop is now much more intuitive, and you can now remove certain fingerprints from the system. And as if that wasn't enough, there's a new release of Plasma Mobile Gear, the application compilation for the mobile version of KDE, with a much improved weather application, 
The Recorder app has been reworked to be more intuitive. The SMS app called Spacebar now supports tap back reactions. Casts, the podcast application, now lets you play episodes without downloading them. And AudioTube, the YouTube music client, now has album cover support. And all of these apps can also be used on a regular KDE Plasma desktop because they're adaptive, so they'll work as well on a smartphone as on a desktop or laptop. Let's move on to the gaming news. First, we have a new NVIDIA driver stable release. Version 525.60.11 has a few improvements and bug fixes, notably to improve the performance of applications running using the prime render offload, so on hybrid devices with two GPUs. And they fixed a bug that prevented GNOME systems with Wayland to correctly suspend. They also added support for dynamic boost on AMD CPU systems, which is a feature that lets the system shift power from the CPU to the GPU on laptops so the GPU can run faster. Not to be outdone, the Mesa drivers also have a release, version 22.3. It now supports the RDNA3 architecture, so Radeon 7000 series GPUs, and the Vulkan ray tracing support has been improved a lot. They also added support for Rust ICL, which is a Rust-based implementation of OpenCL, with OpenCL 3.0 support. Hopefully this might help DaVinci Resolve work on Linux on AMD GPUs. And we also have the release of Wine 7.22, with the beginning of 32-bit on 64-bit support for Vulkan and OpenGL, and support for the raw print process in WinPrint. They also fixed 38 bugs, including for games like Siberia, Gothic 2 Night of the Raven, or Saints Row 2022. I'm pretty excited about that new OpenCL support in the Mesa drivers, because if DaVinci Resolve supports that OpenCL implementation, it means that I can finally ditch my NVIDIA GPU and replace it with an AMD one and run on full open source drivers. That would be pretty cool. Pretty cool, just like today's sponsor. If you're looking for a device that runs Linux great out of the box, stop buying generic Windows devices and trying to slap Linux on it. Just buy from Tuxedo. They have a huge range of laptops and desktops for all price points, for all needs. They are all upgradable, repairable, and have plenty of configuration options up to having your own custom keyboard layout laser etched on the keys or your own logo on the lid of your laptop. And they run Linux out of the box. They ship worldwide and while you can select a few specific popular distributions at configuration when you buy your device, you can also just slap the distro you prefer and things will just run perfectly because those are devices that have hardware that support Linux. So if you need a new device and you want to support Linux development and you want to make sure that Linux runs well on what you buy, head over to the link in the description below and grab yourself a Tuxedo laptop or desktop. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, there's also that dislike button and a comment down there would be appreciated as well. And if you really like the channel, you can also support it with the super thanks button underneath the video, with the PayPal link in the description, or by joining my Patreon members or YouTube members. Both links are in the description as well, and will give you access to a weekly podcast on Monday, and the right to vote on the next topics that I'll cover on the channel. So thanks for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!